Uh, we are recording. Uh, good evening, everyone. This is Charles Michael Mike Beaver with tonight's episode of ProfoundStates.com. Tonight we have Kevin J. Uh, Kevin James. I think his middle name is James Briggs. And let me read his bio to get started. So, whoa, that doesn't help. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, he's an author and specializes in consciousness. And the connection to ET, uh, ETs and UFOs. Uh, his recently published book is titled Spiritual Consciousness, A Personal Journey. It covers 57 years of his experiences of ET contact and UFO connections. Uh, Kevin speaks to many UFO groups, uh, UFO and ET enthusiasts. He has written articles uh, which have been published in Truth Magazine. His published book was mentioned in Psychic News uh, in the UK. Um, he's written an article about ET experiences, which have been published, which has been published in the New Observations magazine. Uh, he's peer, appeared on local radio stations and recently filmed for a TV show, Unlocking Your Limitless Life, uh, hosted by Susan Schatzer and produced by Robin C. Adams. Kevin was a, a keynote speaker in Miami at the Free um, Consciousness and Contact Experiencer Conference, hosted by Edgar Mitchell. Uh, the Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrials and Extraordinary Experiences. Kevin was a speaker at the Consciousness and Contact Conference held in July 2019 at the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. And he was a guest on Willie Strieber's radio show, Unknown, Con Unknown Country, and uh, the Karen Swain Show from Australia, the Kevin Moore Show from U the UK, and he appeared on Melissa Kennedy's TV show, The UFO Women. He is a, a co-author with Melissa Kennedy and Edgar Yeo of the recently published book, Tap into Universal Energy, Understanding Cosmic Energy and Consciousness. Please uh, welcome tonight's show guest, Kevin J. Briggs. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you for very much for being on my show. I really appreciate it. Well, no, thank you for inviting me. Uh, Without people like yourselves, I can't get my message out there. So uh, I should be thanking you. And uh, that bio's quite lot getting long now, uh, Charles. I'll have to turn shortly to think. <laughs> well, I did as eloquent as a of a job on it as I could. Uh, it sounded I'm, good to me. I know at the age of five, you had uh, a visitation by a male and female alien from a, I assume, from a higher dimension, but I'm. I shouldn't make any assumptions. Why don't you start off with that uh, episode or that event, or unless you have an earlier event before the age of five okay. that you well, think is important. The, the event you're uh, referring to, I was actually eight years old. Eight years uh, old. I had a, another event that wasn't linked to the extraterrestrials or the ETs or the higher conscious beings. I was actually three years old, and my mother had engaged a photographer to take some photographs for the family album. Uh, so the photographer came, I was lifted up onto the table, uh, obviously for an elevated position for the photographer. And at that point in time, I looked out uh, around the room and realized that I was conscious. My conscious energy was in a physical body again. And that was really the beginning of my journey uh, of consciousness, really. And uh, the second part, which you just referred to, I was eight years old and I was taking a bath at home. I felt the frequency in the bathroom change. And as a child, I was, uh, uh, I could de detect these different frequencies. I looked to my right and two beings appeared, uh, both human in appearance, one male, one female, uh, both very attractive with long blonde shoulder length hair, deep blue eyes, and wearing a, a jumpsuit garment that was uh, very tight fitting. They were speaking telepathically to one another, which I could understand. And the conversation went, the male is, his name is Art, and the female, her name is Dee. And Dee said to Art telepathically, is this the boy? And uh, Art said, yes, this is a boy. She then questioned him again and said, are you sure this is a boy? And he said, yes, this is a boy. And then she said, but look at him, he's small, he's uneducated, and he's frightened by our presence. And she was correct, I was terrified. And uh, Art replied, yes, this is a boy. I will guide him, I will teach him. There was no, some other conversation within that. 
and then they left. Uh, as I said, I was terrified. I didn't get out of the bath. The bath water went cold. I was shivering. My mother came in to see why I was still in the bath. I told her about the two beings and she said it was just my imagination. It wasn't. I'm still in contact with them now, actually 60 years later, because I'm 68. Orton D, uh, and I've had interactions with them all my life, and they've introduced me to others as well. So what, where are they from this level, or are they from a higher level, where are they from? They tell me that they are fifth dimensional beings. They are from uh, Andromeda. They tell me they are Arcturians. And they tell me that I'm part of their extended family. The only difference is I'm here in the third dimension and their physical is in the fifth dimension. And the only differences between the dimensions are the physical, so the vibrational frequencies that they exist at. And they're able to travel to and from the different dimensions. So, so when they took you, did they take you to the fifth dimension or did they take you to somewhere else in the third dimension? Uh, no, they, they are, I've never been taken anywhere. <clears throat> I, uh, on, when I was about, uh, I was four, when I was 14, no, tell a lie, when I was nine years old, <clears throat> I had another encounter, which was, uh, I'd had some friends around for uh, playing in the afternoon on a Sunday. It was time for them to leave. Uh, and I showed them out the back door and I turned around and I could feel a vibrational frequency in the, in the house. So I went looking for the frequency. I went in the kitchen, living room, upstairs in the bedrooms. I went back down to the living room where that, the frequency was the strongest. And then I was drawn towards the, the window, the drapes, the blinds. And uh, I, uh, I looked behind the curtains there and there was an orb. It was orange, yellow in colour, four to six inches across in diameter, uh, slightly vibrating. There was no uh, communication from the orb. And I hope that I thought I'd attracted it into the home and my mother wouldn't see it. And then uh, the orb, uh, I thought the following morning it had disappeared. When I woke up in the morning, I could still feel the energy from it. I went downstairs and it was still there. To cut a long story short, it was there until Friday. Uh, I came home from school on the Friday, I opened the door and I realised that the uh, uh, all uh, the energy had disappeared. I went to look behind the curtain and it wasn't there. But what happened with that, Charles, was they enhanced my psychic abilities to where I was able to travel outside of the physical body and travel at will where I wanted to go, just as pure conscious energy. And as a child, as a nine-year-old, I would usually just do that to go and visit my grandparents who lived in Liverpool at the time, uh, 70 miles away. I would relax, open my mind, separate my conscious energy from my physical, travel over to their home. I would em enter through the roof. They had a, uh, a master bedroom upstairs with a dressing room. I would sit in that dressing room looking down through the floor, which was opaque. I could usually see my grandmother in the kitchen cooking on a Sunday and my grandfather either watching the TV or reading the newspaper. And uh, it gave me great comfort to do that. And I often wondered if they came upstairs, what would they see? Uh, and I know the answer to that now. They would have seen an orange orb, four to six inches across, slightly vibrating. That would have been my pure conscious energy that I'd separated from my physical and went over to see where what they were doing on, on a Sunday. So that was the, the next stage. Now, you did mention was I taken to a craft when I was 14 years old. I had a paper round. Um, when I left the house every morning, a UFO would appear directly above the house. And then a second one would always appear from a different direction. They would follow me around the paper round until I finished. Then one would generally go back in the direction that it had come from. And the other one would go straight up into space. And But while I saw those UFOs, while I was doing the paper round, I was always aware of a frequency behind the hedge, behind the wall, someone was there watching me. So on one occasion, I plucked up courage and I, uh, I said, I know you're there, uh, can you show yourselves? And two small grey beings stepped out from behind the hedge and I asked what they wanted and they said, I wasn't frightened. They said that there's a group of people that wanted to meet with me. I said, well, I've got my paper round to finish. I've got to go to school this morning. And they said, well, you can finish your paper round and then um, 
we'll have you back in time for school. So I agreed to go with them. I finished the paper round. I was taken to a large mothership. And I know it's a large mothership because of the size of the hangar. It was full of all the different crafts that we see of photographs of the saucer shape, the long ones, the large ones, the small ones. And there was a huge amount of them in this hangar. So that led me to believe it was a mothership. I was led down to an amphitheater. In the amphitheater at the front, there was a table. <clears throat> and on that table were eight beings. The amphitheater was full of all different types of beings. Uh, I wasn't frightened. I thought I was there just as a human specimen. I was guided down to the front of the stage, in front of the amphitheater, and introduced to all eight. First was Art and D, who I've already mentioned, the ones I met in the bathroom uh, when I was eight years old, bearing in mind I'm now 14. Uh, next would have been Anna. She was a, a blue bird type being. Uh, and then next was Zark. He was a small grey. I've got to know him quite well over the years. He's a mathematician and engineer. He designs propulsion systems. He's got a partner. He's got offspring. I know quite a bit about him. He has a sense of humour as well. Uh, in the centre was Ra. He was Anunnaki. Uh, very strong energy coming from him. Uh, next was Tag. He was a tall grey. And he told me that he was responsible for the security, not only of this Council of Eight, but the secure to this quadrant of the galaxy. And next was Chica. Now, I was a little perturbed about Chica because she was, a, or he was a, a, a mantis being, a large mantis being, over six foot tall, these big arms. He looked like a big grasshopper. So I was a little apprehensive when I saw him. And in fact, Anna, the uh, blue bird type being was, and she felt my uh, stress, so shall we say, from looking at Cheek, and she, she came up and comforted me. And last of the group was Orla. She's a tall white, uh, very pale in complexion, large eyes with translucent hair. Uh, I think she's an astrobiologist, she told me. So that would be the group of eight that I was introduced. And uh, I was taken, after I'd been introduced to everybody, I was taken back home, and I got back home about 20, 25 minutes later, than I normally would. And I now have contact with all this, the group of eight, and I have done all my life. So how long did it take you to learn how to get out of your body when they first started teaching you? Well, it was instantaneous. <clears throat> when arts conscious energy came into my home, I suspect that they altered my DNA, which allowed me to separate that uh, conscious energy just by using thought itself. And I thought that everybody had these abilities. And it wasn't until I got to about 17 or 18. Nobody talks about it. Nobody talks about traveling outside of your physical body. And I would just use it in everyday circumstances. Uh, in those days, when I was 17, I didn't have a phone. Uh, if I wanted to see a friend, I'd have to walk around to the house. But what I would usually do, I'd leave my body. That my conscious energy would go over to his home to see if he was in. And if he was in, then I would walk around to the home. And, uh, and we'd go out somewhere. So I would use it like that, just like a, another sense. But because nobody spoke about it, I, I thought, well, what's going on? Nobody speaks about it. So I started asking my family and my friends in a third party. I yeah. said, I have a friend of mine who travels. He says he travels outside his, of his body as pure conscious energy. Do you know anybody that does that? And no, 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 I must be delusional. So I couldn't find anybody. Uh, so uh, what I did, uh, I one evening I asked Art if he could come and show me more because I was aware there was a lot more to who we are than what we're taught or told. So when the when you first met the Council of Eight, were you in your body or in your astral body or which which was it? Physical. No, body? that was a, that was a physical. I was taken physically on a small craft up to the mothership. And then when I'd finished with the introduction to the Council of Eight, and as I said earlier, I thought at that time I was there, the human specimen, to be paraded in front of everybody. I realise now that wasn't the case. This is a council, a group of eight, who, as Tag said, you know, responsible for this quadrant of the galaxy, and his uh, uh, responsibilities is the security of that. So, you no, know, I was taken physically. I was brought back physically. I remember coming back and walking into my gate 
and I looked at the time when I got home and I was 20, 25 minutes later than normal. So that was a, so I wasn't taken. I was asked if I wanted to go. I went and uh, uh, met with them. So how many times have you met with the council of eight since that? If you include well, that first time, how many, ballpark, how many times have you met with them over the years? That's a good question. Um, well, I've communicated with them with all the different modalities of contact that they use. I'm able, because I'm able to travel outside of my physical body and travel on the astral plane, I can meet them out on there. Uh, I've, uh, <clears throat> they can speak to me, I've taught me how to speak or understand telepathic communication. So I have regular conversations with them. Uh, well, okay, specific. beyond your, beyond your, uh, your, your connection uh, psychically with them, how many times have you met them physically since then? Since the first okay, I could, I could narrow that down to just a few times. Uh, the last time with Orton D in the physical was five years ago. I got up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and uh, I got back into bed and I was just about to snuggle down and there was a bright light uh, outside the bedroom window. It came into the bedroom, lit it up like a myriad of butterflies, just like pure white light, and then Orton D materialised in the physical at the bottom of the bed. Uh, I, after pleasantries, I asked them what was the reason for their visit, and they said that, uh, Kevin, we want you to uh, talk about uh, your lifelong interactions with us. We want you to write about your lifelong interactions with us. And I remember saying to Art, I said, well, I don't mind speaking about it, but I'm not a writer. And they said, well, we will continue to guide you. We will continue to teach you. And you will write two books, Kevin. And I, the first book we've already mentioned, Spiritual Consciousness, The Personal Journey. And uh, the second book, I've just about finished it and hopefully get it published uh, in a few months' time. So uh, that would fulfill what he asked me. But that was a physical connection with them. Uh, I've had Ra. He came into my home when I was 32. He's the Anunnaki. I've had him in my home here. Uh, very often he will turn up and ask me to uh, contact somebody. Um, but the in the physical, uh, I'm just trying to think which the physical. Yeah, the, the, because there are so many modalities of contact that they use, uh, and I'm uh, adept at all of them. They've taught me about all of them. And they're all, the conduit for all of them is consciousness itself. So uh, I, use, I use consciousness for travel, for communication, for healing, for education, for creation and co-creation. And they do too. And they travel outside of the body. I've met Orton D I don't, countless times on the astral plane. Uh, they'll, I'll be out there, out onto the astral plane, and uh, they'll come down to the astral plane and we'll connect there. On one occasion, I was on the astral plane just traveling for uh, entertainment, as it were, and a craft came alongside me. Bear in mind, this is out of body, this is astral travel. And the craft uh, was, there was Orton D in the craft. They asked me to come into the craft. They got a message they wanted to convey to somebody. As I went into the craft, I felt that the craft's skin was conscious. And I remember asking Orton D, I said, look, uh, you know, we meet many times like this and uh, when I come into this conscious energy craft that you've created, I see two conscious energy orbs, uh, orange, yellow in colour, slightly vibrated. How do you see me? And they said, Kevin, we see you exactly the same as a pure conscious energy orb. So we're really communicating at a level of consciousness that they use normally, naturally. But I, because I've been uh, elevated to that level of consciousness with an understanding of it, then I'm communicating at their level. So when you, I, I must assume that most of your uh, travels on the astral plane are for entertainment, yes? Yes, yes, Ma mainly, yes, yes. I'm out there, it's, it's very pleasant to leave the physical behind and go and travel throughout the universe, which we're able to do, as they do. But we're not allowed this information, it's all being denied us. Our uh, human history has been denied us. Our galactic history has been denied us. We are much more than we are taught, uh, Charles. So when you're traveling on the astral plane, um, okay, so I've, I interviewed a, a gentleman recently who um, does a lot of astral projection. And um, 
it, my understanding of the astral plane is that it's a copy of the physical plane, and it's basically the same, exactly the same, but but it's based a lot of it's based on your memory. So let's say you go to your buddy's house, and you're flying over a city, and it looks like normal, but when you get to his door, his door looks different than you used to. But then you go in, and he's there, and you wake him up, and you're like he sees you from his physical self. So that's obviously the physical plane because he's seeing you as a as you he would normally see you, but um, but the door was different, so that indicates you're still in the astral plane until you actually wake him up. But um, if you go, let's say you went to a pl another planet on that from the astral through the astral, how would you know when you got to that planet if you were still in the astral plane or whether you've come back to the physical? How would you know which it is? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, in in short, I don't know. I would say that I've I've actually done that. I've flown to uh, uh, different planets, and I've created my own conscious craft. I've been able to do that. So I've been able to travel to other places in a conscious craft that I create, as do Orton D. And and I've had that thought as uh, as I'm flying around that planet, and I remember that particular planet. It was a blue planet. It had clouds all over it, and I thought if I go down below that cloud line, would I be seen as an extraterrestrial? Would I be seen as uh, a UFO? And I, I don't know the answer to that. And I didn't go down below the clouds to explore. But am I transferring from the astral to the physical? Are we able to do that? Uh, that's a very interesting question because on one occasion, <clears throat> I'd been out for entertainment on the astral plane. I was coming back and I materialized accidentally on a small craft which was being piloted by two small greys. They were transporting minerals from the earth to the moon. I materialized in their cockpit behind them and then they they both looked round, said telepathically to one another, what's he doing here? And I realized then I shouldn't be there. So I'd materialized from the astral plane to their cockpit and they could see me. I apologized and I left I came back to my body. I could see my body asleep. I went into my body and I woke up. And as I woke up, a gray uh, uh, being appeared with a large head and warned me not to interfere. So uh, clearly, in answer to your question, I don't really know the answer. Uh, but from that would suggest when, when you, if you understand that the only difference between the levels of consciousness are the uh, and the physicalities of those consciousness are the vibrational frequencies i would suspect perhaps the answer is yes although i hadn't thought about that from my uh, experiences that i've had but clearly these two gray beings saw me and that the other gray being who came to warn me not to interfere so i, I had some impact on their uh, on their physicality yes so when you're traveling the astral plane for pleasure, what's the most common thing you do there? Uh, you know, in that, what is, uh, do you just fly to different places or do you visit different places? What What is the most common thing you do for pleasure on the astral plane? Okay, well, when I was younger, I would just go and visit family and friends, <clears throat> the ones that I wasn't able to travel physically to go and see. What about now? Uh, what about now? Yeah, I can still do that if I want to do that. I, can I mean, do what that, do you yes. t tend to do now? What, what, when you do, when you go on the astral plane for pleasure now, what do you oh, tend now. to do? Okay, well, okay, well, maybe not on the astral plane, but just recently I went over to Russia to have a. I thought when I go to bed, I'll go over to Russia because I like the architecture there. So I went to Moscow, had a look around there. I've been to St. Petersburg. Sometimes I go to the Eiffel Tower to have a fly around. In fact, one one occasion I remember. I went to fly around the uh, the Eiffel Tower, and the there were no tourists there. It was all locked off, and there were just the armed police there, and no crowds, no tourists. And then the following day, uh, there'd been a, a bomb scare or something there, and they'd closed everything down. And the view that I saw as of the no tourists there uh, was shown on the news. So it, it it's um, but that's entertainment from that perspective um 
but also uh, when I was ooh, about 17 or 18, Art showed me how to travel to the higher dimensional frequencies where our deceased families and friends uh, are still alive and living without the physical, but at those higher levels of consciousness. So what's the highest dimension you've been to, fifth or higher? <clears throat> That's a good question. It would depend on what the deceased family and friends are at that dimension. I don't know what that is. Um, I don't, that's the highest dimension that I've been to, but I, I don't know what, what it is. I know I've been told there are, I think, 12 dimensions. I know that most of the Council of Eight exists in the fifth dimension, and Ra, he exists in the ninth dimension, but he's allowed to, or he's able to um, create a physical at will and move down to the different dimensions. So, uh, yeah, 12 dimensions, I'm told. I suspect that the the ones above uh, Rao's ninth dimensions, you'll be going into the angelic realm, the realm of the watchers uh, and source energy itself. So uh, that would just be my understanding of it. So the fifth, fourth, fifth and ninth dimensional beings that they constitute the Council of Eight, can each and every one of them create and show up on Earth with a physical body? Yes, I believe so, yes. yes. And they are here now, they are, they are around us. Uh, we don't see them because our senses don't allow us to see them, or their technologies don't allow us to see them. I access them through, although I have seen them in the physical, I access their uh, communication through consciousness itself. So you're saying that one of them is a protector of this quadrant of the galaxy, correct? Yeah, that's that's Tad, the tall gray. So how would this council compare to say, you know, people talk about um, about various different competing factions within the the ET races and um, do you have any understanding about uh, less than positive uh, races that uh, may or may not exist? Like, you know, I know there's positive and negative races within every type of alien, but but that's you know kind of vague. Do, you, do, do your has your council? enlightened you in any way sh regarding those people those races who might not have our best interests at heart uh just a little bit yes they uh, they say that uh, they've invited the reptilians to be part of this council uh, but they won't the reptilians do whatever they want to do they take what they want to take they're not all bad i've uh, i've only met one reptilian and uh, that was after the incident when I'd materialized in the uh, in the cockpit of that small craft. And he came to see how and why a mere human could travel out of body, materialize on one of their crafts. And uh, he, he was just ambivalent to who I was. He didn't speak to me. He, he just appeared after the um, tall gray left, the one with the large head, after she or he warned me uh, not to interfere. And then he appeared. But they, they've been invited onto the Council of Eight. And I'm sure there are fractions between uh, the different galactic species. I'm sure there are. They live together in harmony to some degree. Uh, they're, they're, I was told that the, uh, uh, the greys are the uh, most prominent of species throughout the different galaxies. But there are many, many species. And many just look, look like human, like Ot and D. Uh, you wouldn't know them from me walking down the street. They look just like just like me and you. Describe the reptilian. The re oh, just like a um, <clears throat> well, a big lizard, but standing up vertical, as it were. Um, Do you have a tail? Uh, no, I didn't see a tail. No, I just saw him standing up uh, physically, uh, looking like a large lizard, like a monitor lizard stood upwards without the tail. 
do you remember his pupils? Were they vertical or? Well, I don't remember his, pu uh, his uh, pupils, um, but the eyes were uh, on the side of his head and slightly slanting and going upwards. But I, d I didn't make a note of his pupils, no. Um, so there's Kathleen Martin, Denise Stoner, yourself, and um, who's the fourth person? Oh, yeah, the lady. Um, Oh my God, uh, that's really terrible. Uh, yeah, you're talking about Kathy Martin, Denise Stoner, Dr. Melanie Barton. And, yeah, Melanie Bar Barton. Bar I interviewed yeah. Dr. Melanie Barton. Uh, okay, so she's the one I can remember her name right off the top of my head. Okay. Uh, so uh, Denise Stoner, uh, Kathleen Martin, uh, Dr. M uh, Melanie Barton, and yourself. The four of you, how do, how do the... Um, I was told that you channel the the Council of Eight. Do you channel them? Yes, I have done, yes. And who who comes through when you channel them? Okay, well, I have channeled all eight, but usually it's uh, Ort that comes through. Uh, and on a couple of occasions, I've channeled Ra. Uh, his energy is tremendous when, uh, when he comes through. But it was very interesting how I met uh, Kathy, Denise, and Melanie. I was asked one day by the Council of Eight to go to a conference in Orlando. It was a MUFON conference. And I wasn't interested in going really, uh, but they asked me to go. And if they asked me to do something, I usually do it. Uh, so I went down. I remember when I was driving down there, I said to Ort telepathically, uh, I don't know why I'm going. You know, if I'm going down here, uh, I want to meet someone that can help me on my journey. Uh, so I got there. Uh, I was very impressed when I did arrive. There were a lot of people there. Uh, many were engineers, doctors, lawyers, professional people. I was surprised by the caliber of people that were there. It was an eye opener, really. And uh, I enjoyed the conference in the morning. And at lunchtime, uh, I went to get a sandwich in the cafeteria and it was absolutely packed. There wasn't a seat vacant. So I bought a sandwich and I looked around and I saw a vacant seat on a table with two ladies sat there. I, I walked up to the table. I said, is it OK if I sit down and eat my sandwich? They said, yes, sit down. They continued talking between themselves. And when they'd finished, they brought me into the conversation. One of those ladies was Dr. Melanie Barton. That was the person I was there to meet. Uh, I also met Denise Stoner at that conference. And then Kathy Marden was one of the speakers. And uh, uh, I didn't meet her then. I think at a later date, uh, we met for lunch, Kathy, Denise, and, and myself. And then from there, uh, I was invited to Kathy's house when we were talking. And uh, Denise noticed that I was channeling information direct from the uh, Council of Eight. So then what we decided to do uh, was to meet at my house once a month on a regular basis. We would write questions down. And then uh, we would, I would channel uh, the camp, one of the members of Council of Eight, usually Art, and he would give the answers to the questions. In fact, Kathy's latest book, uh, Forbidden Knowledge, yes. I think there's about 120 questions in there, approximately, of the channeled questions and answers. So it's quite an interesting book to read if you're into channeled information. But I did fall into it accidentally. It wasn't something I planned on doing. I'd heard about it, but I didn't think, you know, it was something I was going to do. It was the first time when I was at my home, Kathy, Denise and Melanie, we did a meditation. And Melanie said, did you receive any information from the Council of Eight? I said, no, I didn't. She said, well, uh, is there anybody else in the room? I said, oh, well, there's a, someone stood next to me here. I could feel the vibrational frequency. I could feel the energy. She said, who is it? I said, I don't know. She said, well, ask him. So I reached out my hand because I can feel the vibrational frequencies. And I asked, who's that? And then Ort spoke through me for about 40 minutes. I don't remember what was said, although the, it was recorded, I believe. Uh, um, it took a tremendous amount of energy for me to do that. And I was drained for a few hours after that. But then we met once a month, we arranged the questions, and we I channeled the Council of Eight, yeah. So, or uh, Kathleen 
I mentioned in an interview I saw of her on uh, another show, she said that she had can, uh, channeled, allowed herself to channel one of the Council of Eights, but only one time, and then she never did it again. Uh, how many times have you channeled uh, somebody from the council? Relatively. Uh, well, we did. I think we did it once a month for uh, two years. So you have to count that. Twenty-four times. Yeah. Okay. And then sometimes uh, they'll come and speak to me, uh, not as a full channel, but uh, and I've done other channels in front of other groups. Uh, several, probably, uh, maybe, yeah, maybe a dozen maximum. Uh, in front of small groups and things, yeah. So, uh, if if one of them came into you for you to channel them, and you were still present in that moment before you left or before you step aside or whatever it is that you do, without them saying anything, would you know which of the eight it is that's stepped in? Is just by the vibration or how they feel in your body? That's a very good question. I can answer yes to Ra because his energy is tremendous. The other energies from the individuals um, is at the same frequency, shall we say. So I wouldn't know until they say this is uh, R, D, Zach, or uh, so because they all have that similar energy. So no. In answer to that question, no, except for our because of the energy that he produces. And they did check the uh, Kathy, uh, Kathy Odenese. Uh, they have a, a, a laser thermometer. And when I channel the energy that comes through, because the higher frequencies that are coming into my physical, uh, I get the, the air around my body uh, raises tremendously. And I think I did a channel a few months ago at Kathy's. And I think now, what were the figures? I think the the increase in the temperatures was 14 degrees. They took a, a reading of the air temperature immediately around me before we started, and it was 77. And then it, it went up to 80, or so 82, 83, or something, something ridiculous. I can't remember the exact figure now, but about a 14 degree increase. And that's the conscious energy that's causing the heat because it's coming through my body. So that's a, a, a physical reaction to the channeling uh, when I uh, when I channel. So Ra is the is is Ra the ninth dimensional. Who's the, which one is the ninth? He's ninth dimensional. Yeah. He's uh, Anunnaki. He tells me he's five thousand years old, but he he moves between realities at will because he's a higher conscious being. So do. You when you go to the higher dimensions, um, can you notice the difference between that? How how is it? Um, can you describe any differences between any of those dimensions and this one in detail from your memory? Uh, that's a very good question, Charles. Um, no, I don't think I can really because um, if if you look at the one when I, I materialized on the craft, that was in our dimension anyway. Uh, that was in uh, that's, that, was the that was the physical. Yeah. It, sorry. You were in the astral and you materialized in a physical craft. Yeah, I believe that. I believe that is what happened. Yes. Um, so that's in, and there was no difference in in vibrational frequencies that I felt. Yeah. It when I when I was. Um, 17, uh, it's about 17, 18, Art came to me because I asked for more information and uh, he took hold of my hand and I left my body. I could see my body asleep and uh, we went out through the window, just traveled around the uh, subdivision and then uh, came back into the window. I could see my body asleep and I went back into my body. I woke up the following morning thinking that was cool, but I didn't know whether I was dreaming or sleepwalking. So the following night I asked again, uh, for art to come and show me some more. I know there's a lot more to this. So he came, he took hold of my hand. I looked down, I could see my body asleep. We went out through the window. We traveled down into Lee city center. I saw the university, the hospital, the town hall, the museum, buildings that I recognized and uh, came back and back into my body. The third, when I woke up after that second uh, traveling with him, I still wasn't convinced, 
that it wasn't a dream or I was sleepwalking. So I tried for the third night. On the third night, he gave me to go to my hand. Uh, and I said to him, uh, can we go out to the roof? Because we're three stories up, it's concrete pavement below, and I'm not certain whether I'm dreaming or sleepwalking. So we, we left through the roof. And then on one occasion, he came to me and said, Kevin, I'm going to take you somewhere special tonight. Will you go with me? I said, yes. So I took all of his hand, I left my body, and uh, we went up to the roof, and we kept going up and up and up. And I could see the earth getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Then we went into a higher dimension. And I only know that because there, when we went into that dimension, there, were line, there was a line of about 30 people. At the head of the line was my deceased father, and he was stood up. I'd never seen him standing because he was always in a wheelchair for when I was born. Uh, he had a beaming, beaming smile on his face, and he said, Kevin, I'm going to introduce you to your family members going back over 300 years. And uh, the feeling of love and everything from that group was just tremendous. That was a higher dimension. I didn't feel anything different within that those frequencies, within that higher dimension. It was just uh, as I am now at home. It was just, I'm, I've been just there. I was interacting with them. I was introduced to each person by my father. And uh, the first 15 had uh, showed me their last physical, their last incarnation. And then the second 15, they didn't have a, a feature or a face or a physical body. They, show, they were appeared as a conscious energy orb, this round yellow vibrating conscious energy. But they could still project a, an image of what they did in their, and what they looked like in their last carnation. And uh, so that was a high dimension and it didn't have, feel any different from how I feel now, sat in my office at home, uh, other than I'm speaking to deceased family members. Uh, and I used to go and meet with them. I did that for over a two year period and I got so confident with it, I didn't need to go with art. I could go on my own. But I was finding it more and more difficult to get back into my body. So I thought one day at work, I thought, well, I'll go this evening and speak to them. I cannot just not go back back after visiting them for over two years. Uh, so I went back that evening, I relaxed, I opened my mind, I left my body, I went up to that high dimension. And again, that feeling of love that eminent, emanated from the group was tremendous. And I told them that I wouldn't be coming back to see them again uh, for the reasons I've explained, you know, finding it difficult to get back into the physical. But I said, I'll be here when my physical expires and we will meet again. And they tried to persuade me to stay. I said, no, if I stay, I'm sure my physical will uh, die and I've got things I want to do. So I left and I've never been back since. But I know that they're there. That is a higher dimension, but it didn't feel any different from being here. So do you, have you thought much about why it's become, um, I've heard of people who do a lot of astral projection who get to a point where they can't get back in their body and obviously they pass on but do you have have you thought much about why you it became difficult for you to get back in your body at some point i think it was the draw of their their energy uh, that was pulling me towards them their conscious energy uh, rather than uh, my physical energy, which is limited to some, uh, really. So I think that was the reason why I wasn't able to, I was feeling it more difficult to get back into the body. I had to uh, work at it, as it were, you know. So, and I realised the difference and what was happening. So I decided uh, that I wanted to continue in this physical. So you think that the reason you had a hard time getting back in your body was mainly because you really enjoyed it so much out of your body that you really didn't want to go back? <laughs> that may well be the case. I mean, I, enjoy, I, was, I, had a, I had a good life. I was enjoying it. I was enjoying my work. I had lots of friends socializing. Like I said, I was 18 at the peak of life, really, just discovering many things. So I wanted to continue with that. 
Uh, but bear in mind, I've had contact with deceased family and friends all my life. And so it was nothing special. It was special because there were 30 of them lined up wanting to speak with me. But it's not special uh, for I can and have communicated with my deceased family and friends all my life from childhood. So uh, uh, from the perspective of being special and different, only the fact that there were 30 people there. Well, I was just thinking that um, because of how how much you felt at home with the being with your ancestors that I know that you plan on going there after you leave this body, but uh, I was just thinking that maybe that you had a hard time getting back in your body because you enjoyed it so much being out and you really didn't want to be back. You, you, you know, you're, it's like you live in two lives and you get to a point where you really enjoy the other life more than you like this life in a lot of aspects. So, you know, part of you doesn't really kind of want to come back and part of you does. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that, Charles. That may be a possibility, but uh, uh, put it this way. I'm glad I came back and I, I'm now 68. I'll be 69 next month. Uh, and I've had a, a fantastic journey with all the ups and downs that we have in this physical. But uh, I've certainly uh, been very privileged in relation to having an understanding of consciousness itself, shared consciousness, the contact with, as my uh, uh, Art and D referred to me as, extended family. I see my extended galactic family as we here in the physical uh, look upon our aunts, our uncles, our grandparents, our cousins. Well, my family is just a, a little bit bigger, uh, uh, you know, part of that larger galactic family, which we all are, uh, I suspect. Uh, we The memories have been hidden. Uh, we're not aware of it. Uh, I'm fortunate. With, without Orton D's assistant, assistance, and Art was true to his word. He guided me. He taught me many things. Uh, my brother was a, um, or is a retired aircraft engineer. And he was aware of my abilities when we were children because I would speak about it. He didn't have any of them. So I wouldn't have had them if it, not, if it had not been for that guidance of Art and D uh, and then the others meeting with the others. But the other thing was I was open-minded. I wanted to learn more. Uh, I knew there was more because of the abilities they'd given me just to travel out of the physical body at the age of nine. So is there any message that the council uh, in general, not, not, I know they answered a lot of questions and Kathleen put them in her book, but if, if let's say there was a hundred or a thousand humans that got together and said, we want to know what the council would like to say to us in general as a species. Is there any message that you've heard uh, uh, maybe multiple times from the council that you think uh, would be appropriate to give the human race in general? Uh, yes, they, they say they are here to assist with our evolution. Uh, they're happy to share their technologies. Uh, they want to be invited here. Um, they're happy communicating with us. Um, they have requested that they require a mandated protocol to be implemented to receive them. And uh, uh, I, I did contact our United Nations a few years ago, the office of Nicholas Hedman, uh, to ask if there was a mandated protocol to uh, receive the ET, should they wish to make contact with with us and uh, they did reply and said no there was no mandated protocol at this time if advanced extraterrestrials wanted to meet with the united nations those were his words and uh, uh, so i asked well how would we implement a mandated protocol and he said we you have to get a member state uh, to make a proposal and then it will be voted upon uh, so that answered that question a little bit later I was asked again by the Council of Eight, I think it was Ra, I'm not certain now, I'd have to look at my notes, but uh, uh, he asked me, the, he wanted to meet, or they wanted to meet with the United Nations, I think it was February 1st, I can't remember which year. So again, I contacted the office of Nicholas Hedman, who was the chairman of the Outer Space Affairs Committee in Vienna. I, I said there's a group of extraterrestrials that wish to uh, meet with the United Nations on February the 1st, 
whatever year it was, I can't remember now, it's in my notes. And um, uh, I did, <laughs> I also wrote to Dr. De Pippo's office in Washington, D.C. He runs the uh, office there. Uh, on this occasion, because I'd given a specific time and date with the UN in New York, I didn't receive a reply from the Nicholas Hedman's office other than an automated response to say that they'd received my email. I didn't receive a reply from uh, Dr. De Pippo in Washington, D.C. Uh, and I wasn't expecting one because it's a huge leap, you know, for someone like myself, uh, who they don't know, uh, saying that extraterrestrials wish to meet with the United Nations on February the 1st. And I put the information out there on Facebook. This is what they wanted. This is what they requested. And what was interesting about that particular incident, eight days after I'd written to the two officers, uh, Terry Lovelace, he contacted me. He's a lifelong experiencer like myself. He's a retired uh, assistant uh, district attorney for two jurisdictions, a retired law professor. And he phoned me up one day and says, Kevin, uh, I've been given the exact date and time uh, for the ETs who want to meet with our United Nations in New York. I said, well, I've already written to uh, Nicholas Hedman's office in Vienna, and I've written to Dr. De Pippo in Washington, D.C. He said, well, I will, I know Dr. De Pippo. I will write to him supporting what you're requesting. So he emailed as well. I've got copies of all the emails, and he didn't receive a reply, and I didn't. But then Terry told me he went through the back channels of government, and in his words, he got the pushback. So in light of that now, they have reached out through me uh, for a potential meeting, but they still need this mandated protocol. Ra contacted me and said, we need this mandated protocol implemented. And now we've reached out to your governments, the uh, reveal of their presence globally, globally will come from a request from the citizens of Earth. So I wrote out a mandated protocol and then uh, uh, my wife witnessed it and signed it. Kathy Martin signed it, Denise Stoner signed it, Dr Melanie Barton signed it and ratified it. So now we have our own mandated protocol implemented so we, the citizens of Earth, can request uh, a meeting with the ambassadors of the Council of Eight. In fact, if we've got time, I know we're only going up to the hour today, but I could read that I've got the mandated protocol in front of me. I read it out to another group yesterday. If you think it's appropriate, I can read it out. It's only just two short paragraphs, but it includes uh, what they requested and what they needed. So, um, since our time is short, um, um uh, have you have you got any idea when have you got any intuitive idea or i know you've done a lot towards making things happen along the lines of what you've just discussed and everybody's like waiting when's it going to happen when's it going to happen so have you got any ideas intuitively or any other way uh, when you think disclosure will actually occur it's my question is sort of two or three questions in one that's part of the question another part is uh, do you think you know you're you're discussing having a disclosure going from aliens to government but up until now pretty much it's all been through people like yourself and myself and other individuals. So the first question is, when do you think it'll happen? But more importantly, it do you think that the aliens are ever going to get to a point where they're like, screw the government, let's just have an open contact with the people? Even if the government is not ready, the people are ready, that sort of thing. Have you heard? Anything along those lines? Yeah, I, I don't think they will just show up. What's going to happen now is because we have this mandated pro protocol implemented, we, the citizens of Earth, can make that request through people like myself 
through other experiences. And then uh, if the government wants to join in with us, that's fine. If they don't, that's fine as well. Uh, but there are many who can communicate telepathically with our ET star families. Uh, I can call the craft in. I call them in on uh, a couple of occasions. I call them in on the back of my house and they will come down and uh, uh, let me know that they're there. A friend of mine, Costa McCrease, he has a, a large group, etletstalk.com, and he has over a million members now who reach out and do CE5 protocols to uh, communicate with the ET star families. So they are here, they are amongst us. Our consciousness, collective consciousness, is growing now. And there are many talking about it. There are uh, many who are working towards this that we don't see because it's not in the mainstream media. I speak with many groups and uh, I was on a podcast the other day. 23,000 people watched that podcast. Why? Because they're interested in the extraterrestrials. They're interested in the star families uh, and they want information and the governments uh, won't give them the information. So they'll have to come to the experiences like myself. And we are many. I speak with many groups and we have those those abilities for direct communication with the ET star families. And I believe that that's why they've educated me with all the modalities of contact that they use so that I can con communicate with them directly, as do others. So it's not just me. I'm just a small piece in this, uh, Charlie. I'm not, I'm not that important. I'm just a small piece of the jigsaw. I must stress on that because all the other pieces of jigsaw that are put together, we see the whole picture. So if one piece of the jigsaw gets lost, we still have the whole picture there. So you don't think they're ever going to openly have contact until governments allow it? Is that no, 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 we will have open contact, but we, the citizens of Earth, will request it. It will come from us now, from the people, from the citizens of Earth. Well, how many, how many humans have to request before it actually occurs? Well, that's, that's a very good question. I would suspect, let's say, a, a council of eight from the earthly realm who are all experiencers, who all have their direct contact. Why don't we, a council of eight, let's build our own councils? Uh, the, I know of two groups. Uh, one's these bought a $20 million um, old ancient, uh, 1920s hotel, and he's renovating it to be uh, an embassy, an education, a university to teach ambassadors to connect. I know another group have got 50 million to build a, an embassy. They just need some land to build it. So we are doing it without the government. And we're doing it, the people are doing it. The experiences are doing it. The ETs are doing it. We are co-creating a future event. And that's what the reveal will be. And it will come from the citizens of Earth's request for that. So you... Th So you think that uh, at some point humans will just, there'll be a, a large enough group of humans where the aliens will go, or the ETs, I should call them ETs, will just decide, okay, let's do it. And you, you'll have the con have open contact without government involvement. You think that's what will eventually happen? Yes. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, I appreciate you being on my show. I, uh, I'm sure there's lots of other questions I could ask you. Like, uh, or, well, I guess one last question. Um, is, any, is anybody channeling the uh, Council of Eight on a regular basis besides you? Uh, there are other channels uh, that are connecting with other groups of ETs. Uh, I don't know anybody that's particularly, uh, I know a, a couple of others that have had contact with the Council of Eight. I don't know anyone else that's channeling, but I do know of other groups that are channeling to different councils because there are, I think there's, you know, there's several. It's not just one Council of Eight. It's a bit like our uh, Congress here or our Parliament in the UK. There are different groups within those uh, um, areas that, uh, um, that are working with others beside myself. Um, and I think that's where the information is coming from in relation to the 
collective consciousness expanding because uh, one person on his own can't do this. So there are others that are being contacted, very similar stories to myself uh, with their own different species. And I'm sure when um, uh, the reveal does happen, there will be uh, many species there. I mean, if you look at just the, my council of eight, as I refer to them, uh, they, are, they represent five different species. And I know that other people speak to different councils and what uh, they'll represent uh, uh, different species as well. So it will, it will, the initial contact, I believe, will come from the Council of Eight. And then from there, it will expand. Well, there's been talk of, um, there's a particular gentleman, uh, I won't necessarily mention his name, because uh, uh, it's not necessary, but he, um, I've listened to his interviews recently and he claims that the US government is basically working with uh, fallen, he calls them fallen greys and reptilians. And he says that the non fallen greys who work with the mantids, who had a war with the fallen greys long ago, and uh, you know, you hear rumors that, that, um, that the greys uh, bred out of themselves their emotions because of that war. That's a rumor has been floating around for a long time. But he says that uh, that the U.S. government is in is working with the fallen greys and the reptilians, and that soon, this is what he says, is very soon, the non-fallen greys who had a war with the fallen greys are going to come back and wipe out all the fallen greys who are now confined to this solar system and who are no longer allowed to um, go through the stargates. And since we're on the side of the uh, fallen greys and the reptilians, that we're going to get basically uh, wiped out too. And uh, it's kind of a sad story future story and I don't have any clue whether he was he gave this information out on his deathbed because he's about to go into a um, into a surgery on his heart that he's got 50 percent or less chance of surviving so he's he's giving it sort of a deathbed confession and so having said all that there is a question there how do you feel about said story well, I'm, I can't really comment on that because I know nothing about it at all. I've just been, as I say, educated within the uh, understanding of consciousness itself and how it's used, as I've described, uh, for different various communications. Uh, so I don't know any of that story whatsoever. I do know my ETs, the Council of Eight, are here to assist with our evolution. They are happy to, sh they're concerned about the pollution on our planet at the moment. They say we've reached this level of technology in the past and annihilated ourselves, and they don't want that to happen this time. So they are here to assist with our evolution. They're here to assist with their, they'll share their technologies to help clean up the pollution on our planet. And uh, we will create a, a new society that we desire for our children, our future generations. But that society we will co-create with our ET star families, and it will include them. Uh, so we we need to take the next step to become a galactic society and that's where we're heading and we have to get over this hurdle of, of what you call the disclosure for people like myself uh, there is where it's already been a disclosure because we know that there are other galactic species many of them many are here many are making contact so we have disclosure from that perspective uh, so we will just continue doing the uh, the work so you so you don't know of any uh you don't know that the u.s government is um working with any spe any particular species directly you don't no. know anything about that I've no, I've no idea but i don't see why why not you know the ets that can contact whoever they want if they want to work with the governments they will do uh, I've got no knowledge of that whatsoever, and I'm not against the governments. I think the governments, uh, uh, once they realise that uh, we are going to have this disclosure of the reveal of the presence, then they will 
uh, work towards the benefits of humanity. Uh, after all, we elect our government officials and uh, uh, they um, work for the benefit of humanity. Hopefully so, they do. I'm sure so, they can always change their policies. So, so do you, you do you know anything about any conflicts going on between the ETs themselves? No, I haven't been uh, privy to any of that information at all, really. Mine's just been uh, just <clears throat> simple education uh, along, along one thread, and that thread is consciousness. But consciousness itself is the creator. And once we understand that as a species, we can create, co-create that future, which we are doing. And that's why the education in relation to consciousness is vital. That's part of our evolution. We as a species need to learn that. And when we do that, then we can create that galactic society for humanity. Well, I really appreciate you being on my show, Kevin Briggs. And um, one of these days, if you're uh, ever in the mood to channel any of your friends, I would certainly be open to listening to them speak to humanity uh, as a conduit for you there if is. that's ever your desire uh, i think there's there's one on on youtube that you can watch as i did at the free conference if you just key in kevin briggs free conference september 29 2018 it comes up and I, in that channel i channel that and you'll see the energy that comes through when he speaks to me so if you want to have a look at that and then there's another one on my uh website with Susan Schatzer. I did a channel there and art came through. So if you want to see two examples of me channeling, uh, go to YouTube, uh, the Miami Free Conference, September 29, 2018, and then go on my website and scroll down on events and media to Susan Schatzer and there's a channel there. So you'll be able to see two there. And then next time, if you invite me back again, and uh, perhaps we can discuss the channels and I'm just in the process of writing the second book and perhaps we could discuss that. So, uh, but I've enjoyed chatting today, Charles. It's been, it's been really good. Again, without people like yourself, I can't get that information out there. So thank you. Well, your website is www.kevinjbriggs2gs.com and I will post links to anything I can below the show. And I really do appreciate you being on the show. And thank you for your time. And uh, let me go ahead and stop the recording. And